Okay. This is Wednesday, April 16, 2014. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morris Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan. Our cameraman is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus. We are privileged to have with us today Thomas Lamont. Welcome, Tom. Thank you very much. May I ask when you were born? I was born on April 5th, 1963. And where were you born? I was born here in Natick, Massachusetts. And what town do you currently live? I currently live in Hudson, Mass. Your mar uh, marital status? I'm married with two lovely children. All right. And tell us a bit about what Natick was like growing up. Natick was, I always thought, was always bright sunshine and 75 degrees in summertime. Because those are the only memories I can remember, mm -hmm. <laughs> I can recall. Uh, my mother had a two or three foot above ground pool that most of the kids from the neighborhood would always gather upon mm -hmm. in the summertime. It was, we were like the hub of the, the neighborhood mm -hmm. in the 70s. And that was primarily the early 70s. When we got older, you know, seventh, eighth, and ninth grade, we're going to Coolidge Junior High. And basically, my neighborhood's turned to get a little bit bigger, and I started hanging around Avon Street mm -hmm. with my friends, the Ellises, and uh, playing football at Coolidge. Okay. And then you went to Natick High. Yeah, I went to Natick High School. Mm -hmm. Big changes there. Uh, you know, I, I finally got my fear over women, <laughs> over girls. <laughs> uh, went out with uh, a, a girl for about, I think, on my senior year. Started dating, finally. And... Uh, basically finished up my, my uh, sort of football career with a concussion and wrestled mm -hmm. for three years. Uh, did a little bit of track, uh, running, running the mile and doing uh, cross country. And then finished up, just played a little bit of baseball, but I always had two left feet and if mm -hmm. I made the team, I barely made it. Mm -hmm. Either I was only about 130 pounds or I was just too short or just too slow, but I made it. All right, so you graduated class of? 1981. And where and when did you enter the military? Well, I was, I think, in my third or fourth year at Worcester State College, now mm -hmm. Worcester State University. And I had a lot of friends I was just making. I was tending up uh, at a pub at Worcester State, very local, mm -hmm. small rat skull, nothing bigger than this room. And uh, a lot of the ROTC guys would start coming on in, both uh, male and female, of course, and uh, just started shooting the bull with them. And uh, I had a Lamont Family Crest pin on a sweater, and it was mistaken for a, some sort of special forces emblem. They thought, are you in the military? In the, no, I'm not in the military, not in the military. Well, you got to try it sometime. And, and basically, one thing led to another. Since my group of friends were becoming more and more in the military, that I, I thought maybe I'd join. Uh, never been a person that's been very aggressive or very outgoing. One day, it was a cold, I think, ooh, September morning, I think, and getting ready for uh, getting ready for school, and I was parking at a friend's house, uh, an apartment complex with a lot of parking spaces. He didn't have a car, so I just parked in his space. Long story short, another person liked using it, didn't like the fact that I was using the the, the spot, and when I turned to just, you know, to argue with the guy. Next thing you know, I had a, I had a, 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 he punched me right in the chin, and I was more shocked than ever. And I didn't think about fighting him or anything. I was just so shocked, I just walked away, and I walked back to the apartment. And my friend Bob, who had the apartment, just said, what happened? Because a man just punched me, and I didn't know what to do. So I sat down, and that was just between you and I. Mm -hmm. He opened, he uh, gave me a cold beer. I put it on my chin, <laughs> and I thought, you know, I think I'll join the military. I don't think I'm really, you know, I think I don't like any surprises like this anymore. And that was back in 1985. What was your major uh, in college? It was media. I wanted mm -hmm. to be the biggest either DJ or, or VJ for mm -hmm. videos or uh, an anchorman mm -hmm. for television or the best Boston Globe or Boston Herald writer I could be. Uh -huh. <laughs> But you. But it all changed uh -huh. when I signed up. Uh, the first thing I did was uh, sign up in, in the Worcester area. Mm -hmm. And the gentleman that signed me up knew my father. And he said, Don't worry, we'll take care of you. He said, We're not going to, we're not going to, you know, put any wool over your eyes. Uh, were there any veterans in your family background? Well, uh, 
interesting question because before I always walk into this library, I always stop at the memorial of all those who served during World War II, Korea, mm -hmm. etc. And I always look at my three uncles' names, uh, Arthur, Thomas, and Warren Lamont. Those are all my uncles. My father was 12 of 12. Wow. <laughs> and I always pay a little respect before mm -hmm. I walk in here. So that was Arthur, Thomas, and? Warren. Warren. And they all served in World War II? Mm -hmm. I think I had my uncle John serve also in World War II. Okay. Because I, I've heard stories of what his, his uh, mm -hmm. combat experience was also. I think it was against the Japanese at the time. Okay. And were they all in the Army? Uh, some in the Army, some in the Air Force. Uh, my father served in the, in the Air Force. Uh, it's funny, uh, there's a story behind that. He, he, uh, you know how a kid might be getting in trouble and the parents try to interview him before it gets any worse? And but my trouble was, I might be joining the military. And he goes, hey, you're not going to join the military, are you? <laughs> I turned to my father and my mother, I go, no. But if I was crazy enough to join the military, this is back in 83, 84, mm -hmm. I joined the Air Force. And I've been in 29 years in the Army. <laughs> so did you choose the Army, or did the Army choose you? A little bit of both. Uh -huh. uh, Seeing most, you know, as a kid, seeing the Patton movie, I always wanted to be a tank commander. And of course, Air Force and uh, the Navy don't have too many tanks. So, and being in the Worcester area and the recruiting stations were mostly for uh, Army anyway. My friends were mostly in the Army and ROTC at uh, Worcester Polytech. Mm -hmm. So I thought it was the most natural thing to do. So I joined and I did it all to the oath, and uh, I've been here th in ever since. Okay. So tell us a little bit about where you were sent for basic training and what was basic like. Basic training. Fort Knox, Kentucky. I, I never saw so much red-ish brown clay in my life. Everything stained. Uh, if you fell down, you got the clay all over you. Uh, I've never seen it before. Uh, I got in. In fact, I was, it was the, the, say, the day after I went in, let's see, I went to Fort Knox, Kentucky, mm -hmm. the day before uh, the crash, the shuttle crash, the space shuttle. The Challenger? Yeah, the first. Wow. It was one of those wow moments mm -hmm. that I'll never forget. And that was uh, in 86. I think mm -hmm. it was late January, 86. Yep. Mm -hmm. And that's when that happened. And the next day I was getting ready to ship out to Fort Knox, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. I got there. Luckily, they gave you about 72 hours or maybe three or four days of uh, sort of getting acclimated. You know, they, no one came on the bus, no, but a drill sergeant did come on the bus, but he goes, take it easy, everybody. I'm not here to yell at you. I'm not here to scream at you. I make sure all you little boys and girls, well, we'll say boys, mm -hmm. all come on in and uh, be safe, and I'll just keep an eye on you for a few days. Then we got briefed. And I uh, was talking about, you know, what's going to happen to us and all that stuff. We're going to get issued our uniforms and stuff. And during that time, you know, they're going to feed us and just try to get us acclimated to get ready for basic training. Mm -hmm. I did a thing called uh, OSET. It was one-stop unit training. Uh, since it was at Fort Knox, Kentucky, the home of armor, uh, I wanted to be a tanker or an armored crewman. Therefore, I went there for basic and a thing called advanced individual training, AIT. Mm -hmm. It's called a bunch of other things now, but it, that's what I called it back then. And basically, I didn't. I thought I was going to be all yelling and yelling and crying. Didn't happen. We had the we had the drill sergeant that was just the opposite. He was about six foot two, slender. I guess he was an umpteenth degree in karate. He, he was an instructor. Mm -hmm. Slender black gentleman with the, uh, let's say, the pencil mustache. And I, I even, he was even he nicknamed the Black Clint Eastwood. He didn't yell, he never yelled, but you knew he was coming <laughs> down the hallway. Mm -hmm. Everything got cold. <laughs> you could feel <laughs> the hair in your neck go up, and that's the kind of guy, really intimidating mm -hmm. kind of guy. But uh, there were a bunch of other drill sergeants, too, who screamed and yelled. And we, our group was, uh, uh, our platoon was a little different. We were, as I say, more educated, but the idea is we didn't need to be yelled at. We, we were always gung-ho and wanted to do exactly what the drill sergeants mm -hmm. want us to do anyway. Well, we, had some, we had some good times. We had some hard times. Uh, I think uh, 
during a point while we were there, I think uh, Ronald, President Reagan uh, attacked uh, Libya mm -hmm. at that time. And that was about April, May of uh, 86. Sad things uh, that I missed out on. I missed my brother David's wedding. I hope he forgives me mm -hmm. still. <laughs> but uh, he got married on, I think, I believe it was on April 5th, which was my birthday, or mm -hmm. around that weekend. Right. Uh -huh. So well, I, was, I was missing out on a birthday, and I was missing out, and I had to call my brother up and said, sorry, mm -hmm. I'm not going to be able to make it. And he got married here in Natick, and I missed out on that. If I had a little more gumption, I probably would have got a 24-hour, 48-hour pass. And sorry, mm -hmm. but I was locked in. But we had tanks. Mm -hmm. Man, do we have tanks. We had a thing called a Slick 60. In Worcester, uh, in Fort Devens at the time, uh, they had a tank called the M48A5. Uh, we nicknamed 48, well, see, for, between 42 and 48 tons of sheer intimidation. But it was an old tank. Mm -hmm. So, so old that when I went to basic training, the M60 tank was already being used or getting ready to be phased out or updated at that time. Mm -hmm. And they had this thing called the M1. Do you know what the M1 can do? You know, okay. But we never got into that. But I had the Slick 60s, and I trained on those, and they were beautiful. I loved it. I was doing everything I always wanted to do. I was a driver. I was the gunner. I was the loader. And when we really, you know, for the students that really excelled and really wanted to really excel at their, their, their craft, uh, tank commander once in a while. Mm -hmm. They put you in the tank commander slot. But nothing, the nickname, we called it busting caps. And there's nothing like busting caps, mm -hmm. metal on metal. And how long did basic take you? Well, it did it in late January, and I got out about mid May. Mid May? And tell us what happened after. Well, I was in great shape. Okay. <laughs> I think I had almost a, you know, a 22 inch waist. <laughs> and uh, I, there's a picture of me for the first time eating some ribs at a, with a friend's house. And I'm like, I'm, wow, I, I had a V shaped. Built, could run forever. Mm -hmm. I think I did two miles in about uh, 11 minutes, 11 seconds, or something. That's pretty like that. good. <laughs> and uh, that was that was the last time I could do it that fast. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, when I got back, back to civilian life, I was going back to school at Worcester State, but uh, still yearning for like maybe a full-time job uh, with the uh, Mass National Guard. But I did some. Uh, Casual work here at the Natick Post Office, mm -hmm. and I worked at uh, Jonesy's Rexall Drugs for that's been there for over a hundred years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, in other words, you were in the reserves. Uh, Army National Guard. Army, National, Army Guard. National Guard. Okay. There's mm -hmm. the reserves, and then there's of course the full time. Okay. The uh, big Army we call it. Just wanted to clarify that. Jones Post Office. Tell us what happened next. Well, uh, there was some uh, opportunities with uh, soldiers that are in the guard units. Uh, my station was, my, my duty station was at Worcester, mm -hmm. downtown Worcester and on North Ave with the first of the 110th armor. No longer with us anymore. They moved them and the tanks away. Mm -hmm. Sad. And uh, spent a few uh, years there. Uh, by about 1987, I decided that, you know, they were taking the tanks away and they go, well, what else do you, do you guys want to do? And I said, you know, I, do, I excel in everything. I had a great time. I went to Boise, Idaho as a tank commander course. I think not only was I the lowest ranking and youngest person to go mm -hmm. there, I think I was also the shortest. It was, it was okay. so tall. <laughs> and I'm only 5'8". And most, I think the next shortest guy was about six feet tall, but they could fit in a tank. Mm -hmm. And uh, went, I was out in Boise, Idaho. Uh, had a great time there at Gowan Field. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, after that, when I came back, I said, well, sorry, I think the tanks are going away. So what else can we do? So what, what, what's the big challenge in Massachusetts? And he said, well, would you like to be a pilot? I said, okay, where do they have pilot units around here? I don't want to be a, a you know, like an Air Force pilot. Said, no, 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 we've we got, we got loads of helicopters out in uh, Westfield area. We've got helicopters down mm -hmm. at Otis Air National Guard Base, Camp Edwards, uh, down the Cape. Where would you like to go? I said, well, I always like the Cape. <laughs> so I uh, talked to some people down there, and the next thing you know, uh, I said, right, if you want to be a pilot, we're going to make you an aircraft mechanic first. So they sent me to uh, Fort Rucker, Alabama. Mother Rucker. 
L.A. we call it, Lower Alabama. I usually okay. said the bowels of Alabama because <laughs> mm -hmm. it was low. You could throw a rock and hit the top of Florida Panhandle. Right. And uh, become a rotary wing mechanic. And that was back in, I believe, in, I don't know, well, 89, 1988, 89. Okay. And what was your rank at the time? When I got out of there, I was an E-4 specialist. E-4, okay. That was, a, that was a summer of 88 when I got out of there. Tell us what happened next. Well, the next thing was, well, I got a job uh, about a couple of years prior to uh, working in the comptroller's office mm -hmm. for the Army National, for the Mass National Guard as a pay clerk. You know, it was uh, basically, it was just a full-time job. It was no different than if I worked for the post office full-time and then I did drill mm -hmm. on the weekends as a tank commander or, or mechanic. It was that, that kind of full-time job, uh -huh. not, not active duty or anything like that. So I was doing that, and in the time I went to Fort Rucker, uh, did the mechanic school, went back to work at normal, normal pay thing. I was living at the time. I, I was so, going to so many schools and stuff, I didn't have a place of my own yet. Right. So I thought the next, next best thing was just live with my mom and dad, and they were happy. And uh, so I just basically just drove a couple of miles to work at the United States Property and Fiscal Office, mm -hmm. the USPFO for Mass, that was on Spean Street, which is no longer there. Mm -hmm. Another unit, and that, that was destroyed in, back in the 90s. And uh, another building came up for just a couple of years ago. And uh, either that, I'd run down there, because it was so short, sure it was only two miles. Right. So I'd look, do a little physical, little physical training then, mm -hmm. too. So I stayed there for a little while. And then I finally got the chance to go to flight school. Uh, the ro initial entry rotary wing course, the I. E R W at Fort Rucker, Alabama again, and that's when all everything changed. That's when I found out I, I had a lot of limits, <laughs> you know, mind as well as body. Uh -huh. and I found them there. Flying was not as much fun as I thought it was going to be. It was tough. Uh, it was during the uh, the first Gulf War, and they were kicking pilots out left and right because they didn't have either four-inch socks or their mm -hmm. underwear wasn't rolled up just right. It was tough. The, basically, the big four-star generals started coming back on the training schools for the aviation and started saying, listen, I, I, we got a feeling we're going to start losing a lot of pilots when we go to over there to the big sandbox. So let's not start kicking everybody out for the smallest reasons. Keep it academic, keep it flight, but don't do anything else. So that's when they started leaving us alone a little bit. But it was hard still. Mm -hmm. I had a, uh, a pilot, uh, an instructor pilot, that uh, who was in the, I believe they called them the Thunderbirds, the aerobatic uh, helicopter pilots the Army used to have. Like it's, it's mm -hmm. same thing with the uh, the Navy. Oh, what are they called? The Blue Angels. The, same thing yeah. as you know, oh, okay. the Army equivalent uh -huh. of the Navy's Blue Angels. Right. And this man was already retired. He was a, he was a, he was a contractor, uh -huh. and uh, instructing uh, a couple of pilots. I being one of them, and man, he was a grumpy old man. I mean, he, <laughs> he did not like me. I don't think they liked too many people up from the north back then. He all he wanted to do was get, get rid of me, fly the other guy who whose father was, I guess, a my my co-pilot, my mm -hmm. stick buddy. Both of us students were. I was the clean slate one. I had no no aviation background whatsoever. Mm -hmm. This other guy that was uh, with me, his father flew to Hong Kong, and he was a pilot for for some air, big airline. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, United, I think, at the time, and uh, he retired, so he taught his son all the tricks and all that stuff. So he had an easy time, I had the hard time. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, eventually, through either visual flight rules or in instrument flight rules, and after getting over the, those, those hard obstacles, uh, the, my, my obstacle was my, my biggest hurdle was instruments, you know, mm -hmm. keeping your head and eyes in the cockpit and trusting the aircraft and yourself to fly. Uh, after that, I thought, I think I'm going to make it. Mm -hmm. So I think in 1990, uh, either 1992, I forget. I think it was 92. I graduated in April mm -hmm. and became a warrant officer. The confusion between warrant officers is that no one knows where you put them. Usually a civilian will say, what is a warrant officer? And I said, well, I ranked the highest enlisted person in the Army, which could be the command sergeant major of the Army, but a brand new lieutenant from West Point outranks me. So I'm mm -hmm. in the middle. <laughs> okay. And usually, if you want to know what they're, why were they created, it's because they have a specialty. 
would like, you know, if you've had a general practitioner, well, I'm like a specialist that deals with certain aspects. Mm -hmm. And your certain aspects were? Rotary wing. I was a pilot. Uh, Four-star general can come into my, my cockpit, sit right next to me, and as soon as I pull up the skids, then I'm in charge. Okay. He's in charge as soon as I hit the ground, but I'm in charge when I'm flying. All right, you graduated, you're a warrant officer. What happened next? <laughs> well, it was flight school and uh, did, flew for about eight to ten years down at the uh, one, uh, the first of the 126th Aviation Unit down at the Cape, down at Camp Edwards. And, uh, you know, I thought if I really worked hard at it and stayed with it, you know, I'd become a very good pilot, maybe an instructor mm -hmm. and get a full-time job down there paid more and you get special mm -hmm. pay for flight pay. But it just wasn't working out. Uh, you'd have to fly at least, you know, three or four times during the month, during the week. And uh, I believe I was leaving in Milford at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, to drive down there for an hour and a half, beat traffic, fly for an hour and a half, put away the aircraft for an hour and a half, have a little table talk, and come home by midnight on a Wednesday and then Ooh. show up at work at 6 a.m., it's a little difficult. And usually, I always said the best pilots were either people that lived right around the area, people that owned their own business because they can always take off when they wanted to, or I always say divorced people because they need the money. <laughs> mm -hmm. But it usually, it was just a lot of the people were all local anyway. Right. And I was the one that lived you know, far away. They had to always mm -hmm. drive all the way down. But there were some people that lived in New Hampshire, but they just either had the knack for it or, or had the time mm. for it. So after that, I just thought there was something to move on to. Uh, I was almost at the point of my career, I think I was already, already at about maybe oh, f between 15 and 20 years of service already. And I said, okay, no more adventures. I don't need to go out there and uh, show my medal or anything like that. Get a nice desk job, go to work at the same place I can go drilling, just worry about my height, my weight, my physical fitness score, and make sure I can, I, I can hit a target down the downrange. That kind of drive. Mm -hmm. I just, I just wanted to bring things down. Kind of, of course, go, still go to military schools right. to advance mm -hmm. my career, and uh, so I became. Uh, there was an opening for a contract specialist at the old USPFO in Natick, and I took that job. Finally, got my degree <laughs> at the same time, and uh, I've been working there ever since 1994, doing the same thing. And I thought, oh, nice, I got what I want. No more, you know, going out there and, and uh, getting wet and two weeks out in a, in a tent and all that other fine stuff. And I also uh, moved up and I went to my Warrant Officer Advanced course, Warrant Officer Senior course, and uh, got promoted to CW2, CW3. Finally got my CW4 after my senior course and was looking good. I was. Uh, I became the, the, the commander, well, the supervisor of the contracting office now. I was the boss. And that was about 2004, I became the boss. And in 2010, just when I thought everything was nice and smooth, I could have a regular schedule, once a month drills. I could, my AT is scheduled so it doesn't drive my family nuts. Mm -hmm. And I can have my vacations on the 4th of July up in New York. And then I got a call. Chief Lamont, I need to see you upstairs right away. Uh, it was my boss's boss, uh, the, uh, the United States Property and Fiscal Officer, uh, Colonel Bill Callahan, who resides here at Natick. Ah, uh, yes, we've interviewed him before. <laughs> uh -huh. And I'm, no, he's not a man of short of words, but he's a great guy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, loves the military. And, but my boss, my immediate boss, Colonel uh, Thomas Devine, uh, called me up and said, listen, something just came up. We've got to talk to you. And usually... Uh, with things going right, Colonel Callahan and Colonel Devine don't really care to talk to me. They, they say, everything's fine, yep, mm -hmm. it's good to see you, it's not, you know, yeah. everything's fine. So I knew something was wrong. And, but they were very quiet about it, like, oh, wow, something must be really wrong. In contracting, you, not, nothing mm -hmm. ever good happens. You just hopefully you get by and the contract gets done, the project gets finished or something. Right. Mm -hmm. So I go up there and Colonel Devine just gestures right to Colonel Callahan's office. He goes, come on, come with me. And they pull a chair out for me. I go, oh my, what is going on here? I sit down and I say, before we start, sir, whatever it is, I, can, I know we can fix it. I know we got, we got a good JAG officer to help. Mm -hmm. it. Yeah, I thought it was a contracting problem. I go, whatever it is, sir, I'm sure it's wrong. 
and I, you know, because I, what I don't want to do is ever blindside my commander, or surprise him with anything, or have him get a call from a congressman who's not who's very upset why a local uh, vendor didn't win a contract. Mm -hmm. So I thought it was one of these big things, and uh, Colonel, Colonel Callahan just don't before you go any further. Says, so uh, what are you doing for the next year? I go, sir, whatever you want me to. <laughs> uh -huh. Well. Uh, the 1st of the 181st Infantry needs an, uh, to, person, uh, to work in the S-1 office. Since that is your new MOS, after I stopped flying, I became a, a sort of a human resources guy. Right. You know, and I thought, you know, it was very clerical, I just want, that's what I wanted. Get, you know, how about people either getting promoted or transition or, mm -hmm. or, or, or things like that. And he goes, well, the 181st Infantry, the, the S, uh, the, you want to work in the S-1? I said, sure. Goes well. In addition to that, they're being deployed. And he goes. Um, when do you think you can be ready? And it was that I called it the pregnant pause. And all I could see is either react really loud, go, well, I'll go now, or well, I need time, you know, you know, coward. <laughs> so I did. I thought it was a cool thing. I just looked at my watch and I went, three, two, one. I'm ready now. Mm -hmm. Smiles came from Colonel Callahan and Colonel Devine. They go, okay. He says, really, when can you be ready? He says, well, sir, as soon as you, you get my replacement for this office or have one of the people, my subordinates, take charge, I'm good to go. He goes, okay. So we'll give you about 10 days to tell the other people and transition to someone uh, or to take over the office duties and uh, report to the first one he won. When I reported there, generally speaking, what happens is if I was just a regular M day soldier, just drilled, and I didn't have the you know inner workings of the mm -hmm. of the the guard like I do now, because of the fact I'm full time there, usually M day guy gets about a year, a year prep. They find out that they're going to go, they get their life in order in a year, do the training, and then shoot over to the to, their their uh, jump zone or their uh, actually their their uh, I don't call it the deployment zone, but it, uh, it was Camp Atterbury, Indiana, to prep for another say 60 to 90 days mm -hmm. to get ready to go before they go. And it, usually what happens, people get weeded out a little bit and or new transitions or interstate transfers mm -hmm. come in to help out right. fill in the mm -hmm. stuff. Anyway, I had 30 days. You had 30 days. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who had it tougher, me or uh, myself or uh, my poor family. Mm -hmm. Because all I could do is just tell them, we got to do everything now, okay? Uh, from simple administrative things like insurance to getting a, a power of attorney, a will, uh, all, the, all those things to just myself getting, you know, transitioned where, uh, you know, what do I bring? Do I keep my helmet? Do I, do I bring anything or just bring myself? Mm -hmm. All those little things. But I had, I had less than 30 days to get ready. And where was the 181st based? The, one, the first and the 181st was based in uh, Worcester. Okay. Uh, I think around the Skyline Drive, I think, was where I reported. Mm -hmm. But it's been around. In fact, it used to be, I guess they were called the 104th. They have a lot of lineage. In fact, it's one of the oldest units in uh, the state of Massachusetts. Okay. And where were you being deployed? We were going to have some fun in Afghanistan. And was this your first overseas trip? My very first overseas trip in the military. Okay. I mean, I've been there over there for fun in Europe and having uh -huh. a great time there as a civilian, but never as a, a soldier. Okay. <laughs> You're on your way. Tell us what happened. Well, I had a great time in Camp Atterbury, mm -hmm. Indiana. It was uh, August. I just missed a two-week rain. And then before that, they had two weeks of over 100 degrees mm -hmm. of weather, uh, temperature. So I was... I was like either the most hated one because I was the most newest, <laughs> I was mm -hmm. the newest person there, because I was all refreshed, like, oh, well, well, because the weather was pleasant. Yep. As soon as I mm -hmm. got there, weather was nice. <laughs> and they just went through all this, all this tough training. I, I met a great uh, a buddy of mine who I, we're still friends today, uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Scott uh, Salloway. He was the uh, a medic. He was uh, actually a phys physician's assistant. And we became very close there at uh, Camp Atterbury. Because basically, it's a young man's game. You know, when, you, when you're talking to people that are just barely in their 20s and just maybe hitting their 30s, 
and I was walking in at the age of 47. Mm -hmm. And luckily, I was just being a senior warrant officer, and well, being the only warrant officer there, they had no idea how to treat me. Not too many warrant officers in an infantry unit. Mm -hmm. Not too many. But it was mostly administrative, a lot of work, and, and I always say thank goodness for my uh, great NCOs. Uh, uh, my senior NCO was Pat Murphy, fantastic man. Mm -hmm. He lives out in the Westfield area, and he was just a workaholic. He was great. He always helped me out because uh, he knew the insides and outs of, of all the HRO stuff, the S1, the mm -hmm. S1 battalion. So, but I, when I introduced myself to, to my commander, uh, uh, back then it was uh, Lieutenant Colonel Anthony uh, Kucher, I grabbed his hand and said, well, who's the uh, battalion S1, sir? And he just laughed. He goes, you are. I go, sir, I'm just a warrant officer. I, mm -hmm. Usually a battalion S1 is a, a captain or something. He goes, mm -hmm. nope, last minute thing. He, yeah, he had to hop out, and you're the next one in. Okay, so okay. Mm -hmm. I jumped right in. And that's why I say thank goodness for the NCOs. All righty, so camp in Indiana and then overseas? Or? Overseas, yep. Mm -hmm. we went straight there. Uh, I think we had a little R&R &R back home, so I could say you know, our final goodbyes before right. heading out to Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. uh, we landed I, what I thought was going to be, sh I think, Shannon, Ireland. I think we gassed up there and uh, headed toward one, <laughs> I think it was Uzbekistan. I think we stopped there mm -hmm. for a little while. Uh, we, one of, we call it one of the stands. One of the stands, okay. And, and we spent about maybe about five days there. Not, mm -hmm. not too long, maybe even less. Right. Just to, just to get, you know, recoup, you know, mm -hmm. get some rest. And then we had, uh, headed straight into uh, Bath. That was uh, Bagram Air Base. And uh, that was in just uh, north of Kabul. I think we spent no more than about maybe 12 hours there. Mm -hmm. And we did a little hop over to uh, the Kabul International Airport, spent about another five or six hours there, and we were in Kabul. Mm -hmm. Took a nice ride, a nice uh, three hour ride in a thing we called the Twinkie, an armored bus. Uh -huh. And it looks like a giant Twinkie. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, Got in there, and uh, we took about a couple hours to get to our uh, camp, which was uh, Camp Phoenix, just about east of downtown uh, Kabul. Okay. So tell us what Afghanistan was like. Picture this. Mm -hmm. uh, the ability to take out a spoon out of your pocket, go like this in front, and then eat the air literally eat the air, smog, uh, I, I, I'm not going to say stench, but I'm going to say a different scent from Natick. Mm -hmm. <laughs> not too many green, the color green was gone. Actually, mm -hmm. a lot of colors were gone. There was, there was gray and there was brown. Everything was either gray or brown. The air was gray, the air was brown that day. Everything was, it was like monochrome or something. It was just one mm -hmm. c constant color. Uh, it was a busy area, a lot of aircraft coming in and out. Uh, whether it be old Russian uh, aircraft that some of the other countries were using, it was a multinational right. uh, mm -hmm. base, uh, or uh, basically, you know, a lot of civilian contractors. Uh, very busy place. Uh, not too small, but just picture like a small college campus, mm -hmm. walled in, and uh, that was life like for me most of the time. Uh huh. And what were your duties? Uh, my basic duties were just basically uh, S1 duties, the human resources thing. Uh, count them up. Because what happened is, as we go to K Kabul, other units that belonged, uh, that associated with mm -hmm. our unit, were going to FOBs, the forward observation bases. And I had to keep an eye on those, uh, numbers wise. Uh, if someone just, something as simple as someone getting injured and has to be flown out of there, we have to still count, make count of that stuff. Or, uh, send in another person to replace them. To, to replace a person didn't take a day. It took a day plus to replace the person who replaced them right. about mm -hmm. maybe 45 days. You know, from them to go to something like as, as, something as simple as Camp Atterbury to get over here. So you had to know the numbers very quickly. Uh, also, you, you find out uh, who's having, who's becoming a daddy there. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, you get the call from uh, the Red Cross. Uh, you get the, those, the good stuff too, you know. Uh, 
uh, and also simple stuff where uh, the battalion commander wanted to make sure that I knew everyone's birthday, and about the day before, uh, he could write a little note saying, hey, you know, I know it's tough here, and I know you got it rough, but right. hey, I just want to say, mm -hmm. you're, you're, you know, I want to say thank you and happy birthday. And mm -hmm. I thought that was a great thing the battalion mm -hmm. commander was doing. So make sure that they knew the birthdays. And then there was even harder stuff. Uh, a loss of uh, a family member at home, getting them ready to go home for either permanently or on a sort of a 15-day pass mm -hmm. so they could go home and uh, uh, make sure that they, they're there for the, uh, a funeral. Or even harder stuff. We had a private, one of the fobs, get hit with an IED. And it crushed his skull. He went over to, to uh, he, we tried to fly him out of, out of the uh, theater of operations to Germany mm -hmm. to get treated. And he, uh, he hung on as long as he could. And he uh, passed away in Germany. He didn't make it. Mm -hmm. And you have to inform people and you gotta keep things in, in the office so that mm -hmm. no one knows. But when someone gets hurt and everybody wants to know, everybody wants to text home and say, listen, this happened. And that's why we keep it in the office. We don't want people texting. We want mm -hmm. anyone to know over the internet or Facebook that, oh, you know, you know, uh, Johnny got hurt, and uh, right. uh, tell tell his wife, you know, if you get a chance, that that kind of thing. We, we try to avoid that. Try to keep it all straight. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you can do it, and sometimes you can't. It just happens. Mm. And then we have some weird stuff happen. Our first day there, in Kabul, they bring us this big hangar, open hangar, mm -hmm. wall to wall bunks, two or three high, and uh, out in the back, of course. The, the, uh, the enlisted, the junior enlisted privates, corporals, are all on the back side. The senior guys are in the front because they're uh -huh. just waiting for their, like myself, I'd get my own room, but I had to wait a couple of weeks just to get it. Mm -hmm. But well, we're all waiting, but we're all there together. First thing I hear, I, see, I think I'm one of the last guys to finally throw my duffel bag on a bunk. Mm -hmm. And I say, hey, listen, I'm Chief Warrant Officer Lamont, where do you want me? And they just point, I throw my bag there. Uh -huh. As soon as I threw my bag right next to my bunk, I heard a boom. So I go to my bag and I shake it. I thought, I, <laughs> did I bust a bottle or something? Or, no. I hear, medic, medic. Uh, one of the privates in the back accidentally either dropped his weapon or discharged it by accident. OK. And it got, and it hit, the bullet kind of hit a guy that was sitting next to him. Grazed, yeah. grazed his uh, chest. Uh, flesh wound at worst, and the medic was running, and all you could hear was cursing. After about maybe a minute, go, you okay, I'm okay? All I heard was the medic cursing four letter words throughout the whole thing. You stupid! Da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. So we got a little bit of trouble with that. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had accidental discharges that would occur in uh, some of the rooms. It happened. It happens. Right. Or uh, and that's an Article 15, or you know, a write up, and that's you know, we take it very seriously, mm -hmm. and. Uh, it, things like that, when they occurred, you know, you, you got to write it up, you got to take it seriously. And, and you, I'd have to go over to the JAG office and say, you know, John, you know, they called all the privates Joe. You know, Joe um, well, discharges weapon, all right, what, what do you need for paperwork and all this uh -huh. stuff. Basically, that's what I did. Uh, on Thanksgiving, which I thought was a, a terrible day, I, I, I cherish Thanksgiving more than I do Christmas. And I love Fourth of July more than I love Christmas. Mm -hmm. Uh, but there I was, and they asked some of the senior officers if they cared to volunteer on Thanksgiving to, to volunteer to do gate guard, to be on the, on the gate of uh, camp just for the night or, for, or, or just for a uh, portion of their, their right. tour. Mm -hmm. uh, so the privates can either have a day off or you get a guy a break. And I said, you know, I'll think I'll do that. I thought that would be fun. Mm -hmm. yeah. So mm -hmm. I enjoyed that. But I remember, that, uh, I, I'm, like I said, this is a young man's game, and, and, and I am reminded of how hard it is, even for something as gate guard duty. You're in full gear. You know, you get your vest, your helmet, nothing ever comes off. Your weapon's ready to go. Uh, you check your IDs, you know, and, and if anything really, really bad happens, if any of the bad guys want to come through. But it, it was a quiet night, but it was cold, a little cool. 
And uh, I recall uh, uh, some visitors coming, uh, children, they want to see if you have candy. Mm -hmm. So posed with a few pictures with a couple of young ladies. I think they were in their, oh, between five years old, mm -hmm. the other one was 10 years old. They dress up as, as pretty as they can be so the soldiers right. can give them food or candy. Uh, and then uh, I remember it was being very hungry, it was very cold, and I go, well, I really appreciate what these guys go through. And, and that's when I, my good friend, uh, Colonel Salve, he decided to stop by and give me some hot chocolate. Oh, but cool. before then, he also, hey, here's some food for you. I got some food. They usually do get some food, but I, I usually get more hungry than usual. And some of the trucks go by, and I remember opening up my styrofoam turkey and stuffing meal, and a truck that the, the exhaust, perfect aim, I let the truck go and it goes vroom and all the smoke and the exhaust came right on my meal. And I just, I just looked up and I you know, for, for what, why me? <laughs> but then I just looked down and I just put my fork in it and mm -hmm. I started eating it and <laughs> continued eating it. You know, like I said, there's always somebody that has yeah. it harder than you, so I, hey, yeah. I'll, I'll survive. And what's a little carbon monoxide? What's a little carbon monoxide? But so you were mentioning earlier that uh, you gave candy to kids and stuff like that. Did you have any other encounters with the local populace? Yep, uh, we had a, a little outreach program that we did. Uh, we'd send care packages, we'd get pa care packages, blankets, books, pencils, pens, mm -hmm. school supplies for the children uh, on, on the outskirts of mm -hmm. the camp. And uh, if you were lucky enough, which I never was, but I was, I'd love to have done it, is you get the opportunity to go in, in, a, in a convoy to, to deliver it to a local school mm -hmm. or some sort of charity place. And uh, there was also a place where I thought was great. It was for the widows of former Afghan soldiers, whether it be against the war against the old Soviet Union or whatever. And what happens is usually a woman who's a widow is pretty much ostracized in that country. And so we did an outreach program from them, setting the same thing, you know, mm -hmm. helping them get educated with the schools and giving them blankets, school supplies and all that stuff too. Mm -hmm. And I felt really good because I, I thought it was great, you know, to, to help out the community. Not just in, oh, we're going to build a hospital and all that stuff, but even though that's great, you know, they already started smartening up and started asking the local elders, what do you want built? Mm -hmm. If you want a mosque, we'll build it. If you need a stream that needs to be uh, worked on so you get healthy drinking water, by all means, or at least drink a proper drainage, that's fine. We stopped building the hospitals or schools because we found out, oh my goodness, there's no doctors, no nurses to fill them in. Oh. So we asked the elders, what, at least what we can do to do the best thing that we can. Mm -hmm. and they, they said, yes, we'll build a mosque there, we'd like to help out with there. So we gained a little, lot more popularity then, mm -hmm. back in the, uh, between 2010 and uh, 2011. Uh, I was. It was. I had a nice little eight by ten room mm -hmm. to myself, and in, the, in a thing called the Connex. And it basically is, is is one of those truck trailers. They split it four ways, and somehow each room is about eight by ten. Mm -hmm. Sheet of metal, sheet of metal, and there's your room. Just you just think that it's only metal, you know paper thin, but it's metal, but right. it's only paper thin, mm -hmm. so no noise. Uh, but I had a room to myself as a senior officer, and I thought that mm -hmm. I well, I wasn't having. You know, once I had a little privacy. Were you able to keep in contact with your family? I wrote a ton. I think I wrote maybe 10 to 12 letters a week. Not just to my family, to some friends telling you how I'm doing. Because I thought it was the coolest thing in the world to use my signature, or at least saying uh, soldier's mail, on the envelope instead of putting a stamp. I thought it was the coolest <laughs> thing in the world. I want to make sure all, all my friends and everybody mm -hmm. got a, a letter that said it had no stamp on it and it came all the way from uh, from 6,000 miles away and 6,000 feet up in the air. Welcome to Kabul. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so I wrote a great deal. Mm -hmm. Oh, my mom, my wife, my, ch my children, relatives that I thought I'd never see. Uh, in fact, uh, my uncle uh, Bob passed away while I was gone. He oh. was a fireman here in Natick. Mm -hmm. He lived on Fairview Ave. And always, always an athletic kind of guy. He loved playing tennis right near the mm -hmm. high school. Right. And... Uh, a uh, very healthy guy. Sadly, he, he was just shoveling one day and he passed away. Mm. The day I believe he passed away, or a day or two, he received a letter from me. One of my cousins, one mm -hmm. of his sons, opened it up. Uh, I think it was either Rick or Dan. And 
opened it up and I, I, he was my favorite uncle. And I said, uh -huh. yeah, Uncle Bob, hope everything's mm -hmm. fine. And he did help out my mother after my father passed away. Mm -hmm. And I said, hey, you're reminding you're one of my favorite uncles of all time. <laughs> Love Tom. And uh, I mailed it out. And Ricky goes, uh, you know, goes we're going to, uh, I know you can't make it. Uh, we know you loved Uncle Bob. Uh, what we're going to do, and I, I don't know if he did it or not, but we're going to put the letter uh, into his casket. Mm -hmm. and, and just it's going to go with him. So I go over to uh, Del Park Cemetery and mm -hmm. I kind of say, hey, hope the letter's hope you're enjoying the letter. <laughs> that was my Uncle Bob. And you were in Afghanistan for about a year. Yeah, less than a year. They, mm -hmm. do, they try not to keep you there more than nine months. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, as soon as you get there, they, they usually try to do is start putting soldiers on R&R. &R. Because there's a lot, of, we had about, uh, it, you know, wow, just under like 900. And, and they make sure that they're, they're, re, they're replaced or, you know, tentatively, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you get some sort of temporary replacement for them while they're gone. From the E1 brand new kid to the battalion commander mm -hmm. himself. Always, you know, make sure everyone is a balance and you got to keep an eye on the numbers. So this got going on R&R. &R. And I thought it would be cool to go on as late as possible. We weren't going home until about July, but I thought it was going to be June, but it was going to be July. Uh, 2011, we were going to come home. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought, oh, I'm going to go in April, or late, late April, early May. And I'm not going home. Uh, my, wife is, my wife is Jewish, and uh, small world. My chaplain is my wife's rabbi. He was supposed to come over with us with the 181, he got hurt. In fact, he's the rabbi up in Framingham. That wouldn't he, happen to you, Lawrence Baser, would it? Absolutely. Okay. That's the man. Uh -huh. Oh, God bless him. He's a great guy. Uh -huh. When I first walked into, uh, we, we just moved from Nashville to Hudson. So I'll, I'll try to make a, a long story short. Mm -hmm. uh, back in 2006, we were leaving Nashville. We were going to come back to Massachusetts yeah. and uh, move. We saw a beautiful house in Hudson. Of course, my wife, uh, uh, being Jewish, she goes, I got to go look for a temple. I said, okay, look for a temple. And I thought there might be one in Hudson. Nope, no, not really any in Hudson. She, and she's a conservative Jew. So she finds something in Framingham and she goes, why don't you come with me? Mm -hmm. All right, I've already seen it. I, I can't remember the rabbi's name. I think it's Bazer. But come on down and, and, and see it. So I said, right, okay, I'll go. <laughs> and there's usually when I went to church, uh, I'd wear a suit and tie. And she goes, no, no, you got a golf shirt. You got your army golf shirt on. You're fine. Come on, let's go. And we go there on a Friday night. And we get there. And as soon as I get there, I look up and I see this gentleman at the podium doing his thing and talking to the congregation. And he looked at me and he stopped everything. <laughs> and then I stopped everything and we both pointed at each other at the same time. I went, I know that guy. <laughs> I go, I love it, we're staying. Okay. <laughs> Ever since then, oh, my children went through the mm -hmm. Temple Beth Shalom and all that stuff. Uh, and, it, and even a funny story is that when you go, you get a little psychiatric evaluation before you go and when you come back from uh, the war. Before I went, the guy was talking, are you a religious man? I'm still a lot. And I said, hmm, let me see. I have a Catholic mother, I have a Protestant father, and I have a Jewish wife and children. What do you think? <laughs> he goes, oh, you're very liberal and mm -hmm. <laughs> you're very open-minded. And he goes, oh, yeah. you're good to go. Because <laughs> either I'm going to Mass at St. Pat's or going to the Congregational Church in Natick or at Temple Bless Shalom. Name one, pick one. And uh, he goes, you're all set. But uh, he was supposed to come with us. He got hurt. Poor devil got hurt. And he couldn't go with us. And I thought that would have been a really cool thing. Mm -hmm. But he went uh, into the next uh, unit, mm -hmm. the 182nd Infantry, that replaced us. Yeah. Well, he, uh, well that, that was our chaplain. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, well, R&R. &R. And R&R &R was coming up in April. And I said, OK, I can now finally get in a nice little schedule. And it takes uh, at least 60 days to really get comfortable with your job there. We're talking 12 to 14 hour days, mm -hmm. 16 hour days if, if, if there's a little crisis that you've got to work on. Something as simple as chasing a, an officer for his officer evaluation thing. See, my job was not, you know, always packing, you know, heat and getting ready to, to, to bust through the door to, mm -hmm. to go through, see the enemy. But basically, we would basically just keep the, the camp safe. Okay. So we are going through all that, and uh, I remember... I go, oh, I need a break. I really need a break. And I had a good sergeant, so I said, listen, sergeant, I'm not going to come in the office till maybe at least 8 o'clock in the morning, okay? It's a Saturday. I'm going to take the morning off, so to speak, not even work out, have a late breakfast around 7 a.m., and I'm, then I'll come in around 8. 
But if there's an emergency, just come and get me. It's okay. That was April 2nd, 2011. Uh, I usually generally wake up around 4, 35 o'clock in the morning to get ready to do some physical training. It's 6 a.m. and I'm barely waking up. I go, oh, I can enjoy this day. Mm -hmm. Take my time. You know, to get up at 6, that's, that's, a, that's a treat. So I thought I'd close my eyes for another half an hour and then wake up. Take my time. Beautiful day. You, you, the sun is coming through and uh, you can feel it warm. And it gets warmer there. Mm -hmm. And it gets, it gets warmer faster there than it does here. And, uh, and then I'm just lying in bed. Boom. I thought it was an earthquake because the bed was shifting in that kind of circular area. Mm -hmm. Boom. Again. And then I hear beep, beep. And that was the alarm. That was the mass notification system. We're being attacked. We had, you know, we had bad guys on the wire, so to speak. And we had to deal with this. 6.25 in the morning. Now, now I'm upset. Dang it, I wanted to have a lazy day. And this is how I was dealing with the stress. I go, Dang it, darn it, they're going to ruin my breakfast. They're gonna <laughs> and I'm shouting at the walls and stuff like that. And I'd be doggone. I, uh, of course, we always, we always wore uh, at least a t-shirt and underwear when we went to sleep, just in case any, any emergencies happened. And I said, I'll be dang, I am not going to get caught just wearing my underwear mm -hmm. <laughs> or killed in my underwear. So as, as quickly as I possibly could, I put on my uniform, donned on my vest, grabbed my weapon, helmet, and started going to my station, the proper station that I'm supposed to be at. I won't tell you what it was, but it, it was uh, going on. Uh, now, like I said, it was multinational, and it was multi-agency. Uh, and God bless their little hearts. Those Air Force guys, they're so cool. All they wanted to know was, you know, what's going on? Cool. And they were supposed to be in their barracks, locked mm -hmm. in, nobody wandering. And they just, they thought it was like the 4th of July. You know, guns, were, guns were, gunfire was going on, uh, hand grenades were being thrown, party for all. And I'm just screaming and yelling, get back in your bunk, get back in. And all the way back to my, uh, my mm -hmm. office, my station. I, I, I won't say his name. But he was the uh, he was the S4 at the time, which is a supply sergeant. Great guy, but he just came back from R and R. Now he's his job basically is to supply everybody with guns and ammo, mm -hmm. mostly ammo, in this cool little golf cart that you know can speed around the whole camp area, and uh, get all the supplies to everybody. But of all people, he didn't have a weapon. He goes, Tom, I need a, I need a break because I had a, as an officer I had a pistol mm -hmm. and I had a I had a M1. He goes, I, I need something. I just got back from R and R. When you go in R and R, you you turn in your weapons. He goes, mm -hmm. and I can't get my weapon. So I said, great. He said, take, take the rifle. You need it more than I do. And uh, he went off. I went to my station. Uh, there, I was there alone, which really bothered me because my NCO, Sergeant Pat Murphy, is a guy that's really on the ball. And now I'm worried. And I can't leave the office. We, lock, we locked it all in. We're in this little, little cove um, of offices and uh, could lock it up. I mean, but the door is like paper. I mean, you don't get mm -hmm. bust through. And we closed all the windows. We boarded up all the windows. And I'm waiting for Sergeant Murphy to arrive because I'm getting worried now. <laughs> he comes la di in. <laughs> I go, Pat, you know, look, you know, sense of urgency? He goes, well, what's going on? We're being attacked. He goes, oh, I was in the shower, and I just thought it was just a drill. <laughs> so he comes in. So no, this is a real thing. And mm -hmm. then, then we, heard another hand, we heard another grenade go off, uh, machine guns going. and. Uh, I don't think it lasted more than 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. It's very short. People got hurt. Our biggest fear, besides the injuries to our, our fellow soldiers, was that the enemy could infiltrate in. You got to remember, we had contractors in, and the right. contractors mm -hmm. hired, hired the, the, the local uh, people uh, in town. Mm -hmm. And of course, they went through a little security check here or there, but basically, they were just. You know, they were doing janitorial stuff mm -hmm. or whatever. But if the bad guys got through, everyone would be all dressed alike. Mm -hmm. Or, I mean, excuse me, all civilian gear. Nothing different right. than what you're yeah. wearing or, or Dan's wearing. And that was our biggest worry. If they infiltrated, then we're, we're in a whole lot of hurt. But we kept them out. Uh, I started visiting the, uh, uh, the hospital because uh, I had to get a count of who got hurt, what happened. And... Uh, Got the account there. A couple of people got hurt. Nothing too bad. A couple of wounds. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of concussions. Mm -hmm. 
and then uh, started to getting a, a, a brief of what, you know, what occurred. So we were locked down for most of the day. And then by, I think by late afternoon, everything was fine. We mm -hmm. opened up the, we didn't open up the post to any civilians to come in. We kept it naturally closed, but we could walk around. Right. Mm -hmm. All right, so everything calmed down by then. And then the th next thing we do is just start doing all the paperwork and gathering, you know, uh, uh, who's going to get a Purple Heart? And you know, that, that, like I said, that's what the S1's job is too. Who's mm -hmm. going to start getting medals? And if they qualify, then mm -hmm. help them out through the coming weeks. And during those coming weeks, which was really cool, uh, General Petraeus contacted our office. Mm -hmm. His office contacted ours. He said, "Guess who wants to come and visit?" And uh, he wants to meet the people who are guarding the gate that kept the bad guys out. Mm -hmm. And uh, he came. And, uh, Handed out medals, coin, gave out general coin and stuff like that. Wow! And it was it was a big treat for the guys, and I uh, had no problem getting photo. He, he stayed as long as he could, mm -hmm. make sure all the guys had photos with him, and uh, that was a great day. Um, and here I was just getting ready. I was getting ready for R and R. I wanted to go on R and R fast, but that was probably the the most exciting thing that occurred. Mm -hmm. um, there was also some stuff mistakes that soldiers make uh, that that uh, that they didn't make it. You know, uh, one OD'd, even though we weren't allowed to have, of course, you know, drugs there, mm -hmm. but we weren't even to have, uh, allowed to have liquor. Mm -hmm. And uh, somehow a soldier got a hold of it, and that was tough. That was tough. Uh, he never made it. Uh, I, I remember we, they took him out in a wheelbarrow in, in, the, in the common area, mm -hmm. place where we do our parading stuff, and uh, they... They were trying to give him CPR, and he was already gray, and he was already gone overnight. He was in trouble for, I think, uh, for a couple of things. He just, he, a kid that just, we just said, you know, at least in my opinion, he said just couldn't, couldn't make it, even mm -hmm. though, you know, he wasn't alone. Maybe he felt like he did. Right. But that was one of my sadder days. Mm -hmm. And uh, that and the other private that got us crushed skull crushed. Mm -hmm. We had a first sergeant who uh, who had a who was a hurt due to an IED. Uh, a kid in a bicycle rode by, dropped off the bike and blew up. Uh, he lost the ability to walk and he came home. Uh -huh. He was a great guy. He was a great first sergeant mm -hmm. from one of the uh, FOBs. He was great. Always good attitude. Never, never, never really uh, I had a bad word to say about anybody. In fact, uh, in, in things like a Camp Atterbury, the stress is all self-induced sometimes. We had one kid go away wall. Mm -hmm. you know, we had to chase him down. Oh, boy. And he ran all the way back to Massachusetts, and he mm -hmm. just wanted, he didn't want to play anymore. Mm -hmm. Things like that, you mm -hmm. know. But uh, finally made it to R&R. &R. Well, Chaplain Bazer slash Rabbi Bazer recommended, mm -hmm. don't go home. It might break the kid's heart when you leave again. You've already yeah. left once. Why don't you, you and Rachel meet somewhere in Europe or whatever and, and enjoy a, like, a, a vacation or a second honeymoon or something? Hmm, honeymoon. Where would I want to have my honeymoon? So I thought of the Holy Land. That's right, Scotland. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. my Holy Land. Father, my, my father's side, Cal came from Scotland. I said, I always wanted to visit Scotland. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe didn't ever get a chance to play at St. Andrews, but, at that, but anyway, that was one of the great benefits I had uh, to do R&R. &R. Free plane ride to wherever you want to go. I want to go to Scotland. I want to land in Edinburgh, enjoy Scotland. I want to buy a kilt. You know, and there's a picture of me, in fact, near a, a steer somewhere uh, in Edinburgh where uh, there's a mansion nearby, an old, like, 200, 300-year-old mansion where General Petraeus spent his R&R &R with his wife uh, before uh, uh, he went uh, on his R&R. &R. And uh, I thought it was great, but I never had a chance to stay there. But I was staying in another place. Mm -hmm. I was there for the great wedding uh -huh. when uh, the, the, the royal couple got married uh, oh, in boy. 2011. I thought mm -hmm. that was cool. So they had a big screen right next to, uh, right mm -hmm. in a plaza near my room. Watched it there. Had a great time with my wife, Rachel, in Edinburgh, Scotland. Went to uh, England, spent a little time in London. Mm -hmm. Went to Portsmouth, England. Took a boat ride, and I wanted to to visit Normandy Beach. That was on my bucket list. So mm -hmm. I got to visit Normandy in, in, in Cannes. Wow. So I, I, you know, I took full advantage of you know, what mm -hmm. I could do. A lot of fun. And after R&R, &R, then what happened? Came back. Mm -hmm. Came back to Afghanistan. Uh, I, uh, basically, uh, 
they already they were already beginning to wrap stuff up because uh, we were, because it was mid May, mm -hmm. and uh, we always everyone's getting a little short time disease we, we call, you know everyone's getting too antsy about coming home and being a little lax in their duties, so everyone had to stay on top of their stuff or, or guess getting you know they started getting ready for inspections again, you know with the local sergeants the the, mm -hmm. the, the, the platoon sergeants to make sure soldiers. Don't feel sad, mm -hmm. you know. No dear, no dear John letters. Everything okay? Mm -hmm. You know, we got to keep an eye on suicide rate and you know, all those things. And uh, so we were, get, we were basically still getting ready to go home, wrapping things up. Uh, you know, make sure the soldiers were rewarded. You know, can't make you all millionaires, but we're going to give you a medal, <laughs> that kind of stuff. And uh, basically, uh, the weather was getting nice and warm. And, and it, yes, it does snow in Kabul. This is a picture of a little snowman that we made. Uh, it only lasts about a day or two. Mm -hmm. But it also keeps the uh, smog down, which we like. We like it when it rains, we like it when it snows. Mm -hmm. it keeps the smog down. Uh, no, big, no big whoop we landed. I think we took off from Bath. We thought we were having to go to Germany, to Shannon, to uh, uh, Indiana, and then recoup there and mm -hmm. sort of you know, uh, for their, our D-MOBE. And, uh, but what happened was we really, the, the colonel was really cool. Instead of going, making two stops, we made one stop in Germany and uh, spent about maybe 12 hours there. Uh, after the plane refueled, we went straight home. Landed in a place called Bangor, Maine. Mm -hmm. It was 4 or 5 a.m. in the morning. Mm. Uh, it was July, so the sun was coming up. Okay. And the first thing I could see that was the coolest thing in the world was green, the color green. Uh, trees, there are trees here. And uh, since Bangor, Maine, I don't think is a, a, a very busy airport, uh, I get the chance to run around there. And the first thing I did was I headed right for the exit and made sure that I didn't, the doors didn't close up on me. But as soon as I headed out the exit, I just opened up the door. And as soon as the door opens, a slight breeze came in and I could breathe. Mm -hmm. I didn't need the spoon anymore to get the right. air. Mm -hmm. I, I could breathe. I could just... <sighs> air. It was, it was, to me, it was New England air. Mm -hmm. I missed it so much, and I loved it. And, and that's when I felt a lot more comfortable. The stress was relieving. Uh, I called my wife. I said, I'm on U.S. soil now, and I'm good to go. I called my mom, mm -hmm. and, I just, and then I waited. I waited for the... <laughs> Waited for the shops to open, because the first thing I wanted was a lobster roll. <laughs> <laughs> and the woman is looking to watch. Man, it's 6 a.m. We're open, but ma'am, do me the honor. I've been on a plane for 12 hours. And, mm -hmm. Sure, a few soldiers, no problem. Got a lobster. Got a picture of me eating a lobster roll. <laughs> the second to only the thing that I missed uh, while I was there uh, on Thanksgiving, the day before Thanksgiving, W E E I. Uh, uh, contacted us and said, hey, any soldiers want to talk about how things are going there? And we talked to them. Uh, Colonel Salloway and myself, mm -hmm. got the, we, we decided, hey, we'll volunteer. We'll, we'll take the call. So we took the call, talked to Dennis and Callahan. Oh. Great questions. How you guys doing? The basic stuff. How was morale? Morale is great. Everything's good. Uh, it, what do you miss? And I made the mistake. Now, I made the mistake of telling things I really basically talked because Colonel Salloway and I were talking about uh, food. Mm -hmm. we missed him. And then the first thing I said was, oh, I could go for a Casey's hot dog right now. <laughs> if you guys can send him over from Casey's, I'd, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd bless the, uh, the ground you walk on. And I miss my wife, and I miss my kids, and I miss my mom, and I miss Natick, and I miss this, that, and the other thing. My brother Greg, who was driving, uh, was commuting to work, uh, heard me on the radio, and he was crashed. He goes, mm -hmm. <laughs> Tom's on the radio, Tom's on the radio. They, they rebroadcasted on Thanksgiving Day. So a few, a few of my friends heard me, and that was cool. And I, got, I still got the broadcast on my iPod, mm -hmm. and uh, it, was, it, was, it was a nice little thing. Uh, but uh, I remember, uh, I guess it was Skype, you could talk, which another, another great relief or stress was Skype, that mm -hmm. you could see your family and, yeah. whew, instead of a phone call or, or mail. Mm -hmm. uh, I got Skype so I could see their faces and everything was mm -hmm. nice. And the first thing out of my wife's thing was Casey's. The first thing you miss, the most, the number one thing you miss is Casey's. I said, yeah, but I thought we were talking about food. <laughs> of course, I miss you, honey. I love you. Mm -hmm. and just, did you get? You know, we caught up with each other. Do you, you know, miss my? You know, do you get all my letters? You guys can write to me too. 
everyone was jealous. I wrote so many letters that the unit, not too many guys at that time wrote anymore. They just emailed yeah. and they mm -hmm. got all that stuff. I go, well, that's no fun. Right. And so I got lots of letters from friends and that was good. Couldn't <laughs> wait till mail call. I take it when you got back to the area, you did make a stop. <laughs> I did make a stop. Absolutely. Uh, uh, at that time, I think it was summertime, so Casey's was closed in July or August. Uh -huh. So I was sad about that. But uh, I, I wanted to at least get a, a, a dinner real quick at, a, at an old place. So my wife got reservations at the Wayside Inn. Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. some of my members of my family greeted me at the house. Mm -hmm. And uh, we came home uh, and started having a big meal there. And, and one of the ladies there was, uh, her, her husband, I guess, was a veteran. And uh, she was all crying. She was mm -hmm. one of the waitresses hugging me all the time. <laughs> Had a grand old time. Uh, it was great about the flight home is that instead of uh, uh, landing at Logan, we landed right at the Worcester Airport, which, nice. the, which yeah. was the base of the unit anyway. Mm -hmm. Had a state police escort all the way to, the, uh, to our armory. Families were all waiting there. All the, everyone took off except me. My poor wife, she... Grabbed the kids. She was running late. She grabbed the kids, and I was the last guy sitting at the parking lot with my wife. She goes, "Get in!" I jump in the back seat. Fuck them home. That was my greeting. Home. That was the first thing that happened when I got home. Uh, but my oh, mother was waiting for me at my house. Oh, and, that was nice. And uh, it was great. Uh, okay, so that was uh, summer of 2011. Yep. What have a, you been doing since? Oh, uh, hopefully things have been a lot quiet. Mm -hmm. uh, some hard stuff. Uh, getting acclimated. Uh, I think we took a, we went straight, my mother has a house up in York, Maine, mm -hmm. and that's the first thing I wanted to do. I want to just go to the beach, I just want to enjoy the lighthouse of Noble mm -hmm. Light, I just want to enjoy, you know, something I haven't seen in a long time, the beach. And uh, I remember we went to a, a supermarket there, and I had a, I couldn't stay too long in there. It was, I had to get used to not being in crowds. Mm -hmm. When we were in crowds, they had a bazaar. They had a bazaar at the, on, I think it was Fridays, I believe, where the locals would sell their goods. Mm -hmm. Fridays and Mondays. And it was very crowded. But, you know, our soldiers, we walked in with our uniforms. We always had, we carried our weapon with us. And when you didn't want to be talked to, if you, if you want to be left alone, you just went like this. You just grab your chest, and mm -hmm. on, usually on your chest is your weapon. In my case, it was my pistol, and I just went, you know, please don't talk to me. Or I don't want to negotiate. I'll approach you if I wanted to buy something from, you know, mm -hmm. buying bowls and stuff like that. So when I went to the supermarket, it, it was a Hannaford in New York, and I, well, the first thing I was shocked by was all the colors. You know, like a Lay's potato chip bag, it was yellow, bright yellow. I almost felt like it was too much, was like information overload. And the crowd was big because it was, it was near the 4th, it was just after the 4th of July holiday, and the, everyone summit starting their vacations, and, and children screaming, and you know, mm -hmm. how, you know where a normal devil just, just in and out. Mm -hmm. I was just, I kept it going for my chest. <laughs> my wife was going, you okay? And I said, yeah, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. I think I'll sit in the car for a little bit. <laughs> so that's, I didn't get acclimated quick enough. All right. Mm -hmm. you know? And yes, there were some issues between my wife and I. We had to get reacquainted. And, uh, and uh, the children and all that stuff. Uh, it, it wasn't too bad, but mm -hmm. it, was, it, it was some hard days. But there was some fun stuff too, just to just to hold her hand and, right. and, and and just be with her. Well, at least you had only one deployment, as opposed to some folks who have been deployed four or five times. Mm -hmm. uh, some guys were in the middle of divorces while they were oh, wow. deployed on their fourth deployed deployment, especially infantry units, especially the MPs. Okay, they had it tough. They, I, yeah. I swear, they almost would every every other year. They were, those units were going. And they must have had it really tough at the home front. Mm. But, you know, the Army also dedicated, you know, some uh, family relief, whether it be monetarily, mm -hmm. uh, counseling, or, or just plain old just having a babysitter come. Uh, they even offered, you know, free, uh, especially in this reason, free plowing if you, if you couldn't <laughs> go out and shovel, you know. And uh, also the care packages that came in. Mm -hmm. uh, they, I think there was a, a church over in Framingham that I, I wanted to, but they asked me to come over and say a few words because I wanted to thank them because most of the packages came from them. And Rachel's temple. And I just plain old just said thank you. And they, they, they just said, no one would ever come back to say thank you. <laughs> a direct recipient of the boxes that were sent 
world, over to oh. Afghanistan or Iraq or mm -hmm. anywhere around the world. So mm -hmm. they thought it was a cool thing to do. And I, I enjoyed that. It, mm -hmm. Just to say thank you and come full circle with these packages came. Mm -hmm. So what are you doing these days? Well, uh, right now I'm a contract specialist mm -hmm. for the government for the Massachusetts National Guard. What is that? We buy stuff. We buy stuff for the National Guard. Uh, I have an unlimited warrant, which means I sign the contracts for the government uh, to the vendors saying that, you know, the, the government has obligated funds for this, make sure everything's on the up and up and mm -hmm. down. And that's what I all, that's the only thing I do. <laughs> uh, uh, and I've been doing that ever since 1994 and then have little stints here and there, but ended up uh, been doing that since 2011 and really not, nothing else. Mm -hmm. And you're still Chief Warrant Officer? CW4. Mm -hmm. uh, finished off my senior staff course, eligible for five someday. Uh -huh. You know, if, if there's ever a slot out there for me, mm -hmm. you know, anybody out there. <laughs> and uh, uh -huh. still doing my contracting, mm -hmm. uh, f still with the Mass National Guard, and uh, just recently had an opportunity to work for the California one. And that's still in the works right now, mm -hmm. doing the same thing. Uh, Son and daughter now in high school, or now mm -hmm. the grades are moved up to the high school. Most of the high points are junior high. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, basically that's what I've been doing. Uh, in between then, uh, like I said, I, I worked in the Honor Guard uh, since in 85 to like 1990, where we rode horses, we did parades, we did funerals. Mm -hmm. I did the, 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 the riderless horse uh, during uh, funerals for veterans. Mm -hmm. Uh, we buried the last four-star general of World War II mm -hmm. in New Hampshire. I forget the name of the town, but they had the first, very first uh, public library. And uh, I thought that was a great honor. And I mm -hmm. met my first Medal of Honor recipient. We almost ran him over in our truck. <laughs> and we were, we were in a horse trailer. And I'm like, stop, stop. And this <laughs> man, this old elderly gentleman in this beautiful tan uniform. And all I could do is point at his neck. And I go, oh my open up the door and I shook his hand around his neck was the Medal of Honor mm. I said who are you I want a picture of you with me and the horse he goes after the funeral he was I believe a captain for that general mm -hmm. during World War II those are the things you get to do that I did get to do in my career that you know maybe you're not gonna be a rich man in the army um, but you get these these weird opportunities uh, to be in the public eye or do things that are a lot mm -hmm. of fun mm -hmm. we were on an old uh, WBZ uh, show called PM Magazine uh, back in the uh, mid 80s uh, that uh, we got to show the, ho the horses off and uh, talk about the, uh, the Massachusetts Honor Guard, you know, the state's own, where we, where we would ride in colonial outfits in Charlestown, right at the Bunker Hill Monument, mm -hmm. go through uh, the North End, uh, cross over George Washington Bridge into the North End, go through uh, Faneuil Hall go up to the State House, do uh, uh, drill and ceremony with the horses mm -hmm. right on the Boston Common, do a flag ceremony at the State House. Uh, those were great, great times for me. Mm -hmm. Never was it, you know, was it still a poor private or a poor <laughs> E4, but I uh, still had great times. Those were the fantastic times with friends. Did you ever wonder what it would have been like if that kid hadn't punched you in the chin? <laughs> <laughs> well, he was a, he was a middle-aged gentleman. Mm. Uh, I'm not gonna say he was a Worcester cop, but he was a Worcester cop. <laughs> okay. And he was having his bad day. That's why I kind of forgave him. <laughs> so, I, I might have still joined, but then again, mm -hmm. I wanted to be either a guy behind the camera mm -hmm. or an interviewer like yourself or on television, mm -hmm. on radio, or writing for a newspaper. Mm -hmm. I could have been doing that. But you got to do a lot of things over the past 30 years. Uh, Between tanks, horses, uh, going to Afghanistan. Yeah. So in addition to what you're doing now, uh, did you join any veterans organizations? Oh, with the Natick American Legion, mm -hmm. uh, the Natick Amphets. I don't go there much often, but the idea mm -hmm. is, uh, since I don't live in the area, but I, I always wanted to be some part of, some part of Natick mm -hmm. in a small way. Uh, if I move, I'll join the American Legion there or, mm -hmm. or whatnot. But I have every intention. My dream was always to someday retire and come back to Natick. Mm -hmm. But uh, those are the local groups I joined. Uh, I'm on the Warrant Officer Association, life member. It's a national group, a uh, great group that helps out warrant officers if, and sometimes their families with scholarships, just like the American Legion. 
and the AMFETS do, you know, mm -hmm. money for the children of veterans. Now, I've been asking uh, some of the more recent veterans about what the Commonwealth has been offering, because there's oh, the, the thing about Massachusetts being in the forefront of veterans' benefits. One of the big things that came up, which I thought was really cool from, from mm -hmm. the governor and from the, the Commonwealth, was uh, sort of a, a monetary bonus. Mm -hmm. We know you guys are having a hard time out there, but how would you like $1,000 just to help tie things over? And I thought that was fantastic. Mm -hmm. But of course, they go, but if you go over here again, the money will <laughs> is going to dwindle a little bit, mm -hmm. you know, for 500 some, some, some guys didn't get any money because they were on their fourth tour. Uh, I came back, uh, and they gave, uh, next thing I knew, I got a check for $1,000, and I go, well, that's nice. It, it, the, this is, the Commonwealth has not forgotten you. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, the non-monetary things that are just as important, uh, family help mm -hmm. programs like that. Uh, the governor wanted to make sure, through, the, through TAG, the adjutant in general, uh, you know, are our soldiers being taken care of, are our families taken care of at mm -hmm. the same time? Soldier and family, one and the same, you know. Do not separate them. Mm -hmm. You know they both need help. They you know they got to be demobbed and they got to get used to each other. And, and we got to offer as, as best as we can for family programs, mm -hmm. from something as simple as what we we're talking about babysitting and snow plowing, mm -hmm. to actual you know counseling between the people that are having problems. Mm -hmm. um, another cool thing that, that the Massachusetts uh, had was you know I, I was awarded the Bronze Star. Uh, I thought it was a great honor to receive that, and. Uh, the Commonwealth says, not only can we get a bronze star on your plate, you probably you're, you're excused from excise tax or something like that for the mm -hmm. for the as long as you have that bronze plate. And I thought, oh, that was pretty cool. Mm -hmm. little, you're not going to be a millionaire, but you know at least it helped us financially. Mm -hmm. And how did you go win the bronze star? It was for the tour uh, in, in Afghanistan, okay. and of course that that cool day on uh, mm -hmm. that weird day on uh, April second. All right, Tom. Is there anything else you'd like to say before we wrap things up? Well. In regards to being in the Mass National Guard, mm -hmm. and if you really are interested in it and wanting to be in it, pace yourself. Have fun. You know, you always mm -hmm. quit. And this is not, you're not going to get drafted. Mm -hmm. But as you volunteer, you also volunteer for the responsibility. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to be the gung-ho person that you think you're going to be at the age of, say, 20, that's fantastic. Pace yourself if you want to make it a career. It's a marathon, not a race. Mm -hmm. You know, some people go in there, they get the free tuition and all that stuff, and that's fantastic. And they just do their six years or whatever, and then they get out. I thought that's what I was going to do. Mm -hmm. and, and I've been in, uh, this October, uh, it'll be 29 years. Mm -hmm. So I really get in there, and I, luckily, I, maybe I have paced myself. <laughs> I, I loved it. And I also am reminded of uh, two words, citizen soldier. I'm a citizen of this country. I'm a citizen of the Commonwealth. I am a civilian, foremost, mm -hmm. soldier second, when the time comes. So when I get home, take off the jacket, take off the military coat, you know, do your family stuff, take care of your family, take mm -hmm. care of yourself. That was probably paramount of what I got to remind myself of. Mm -hmm. You know, there's life after the military. Yes. You know. <laughs> Well, Chief Warren Officer Thomas Lamont, uh, we thank you so much for taking part in the Native Veterans Oral History Project. My pleasure, absolute pleasure. Okay.